Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event. I'm really excited about today's event, which is a power chat with Anne McKevitt. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Katrina Fox, your host, and I met Anne about 18 months ago um, through a mutual friend of ours. Thank you, Karen. If you're watching and listening, I think you might be. And I was absolutely blown away by Anne's both personal journey and her wealth of business experience. I know because you've signed up for this, you've already had a taste of what she she does, but she works with you know everyone from A-list celebrities, multinational corporations politicians, presidents, you know, the whole works. And she's got an absolutely amazing journey and such a wealth of brand building experience. So I'm really excited that um, she's agreed to, to do this. And of course, she's been vegan for 47 years. So there's a gold star right there. <laughs> and although Anne has been, she has worked with vegan and plant-based brands over the years, she's really kind of now focusing a lot of her efforts on helping to fast track the growth of the vegan and plant-based sector. So we've been chatting, you know, before we've done the interview about how vegan cheese is so amazing now and it's it's all really happening. So I'm really excited to introduce you to, uh, to Anne. And so today what we'll be doing, um, the webinar is going to run for about 90 minutes. Um, I'll be chatting to Anne to up to a maximum of an hour because I really want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for you, the audience, to ask Anne questions because this is quite a rare opportunity um, to actually kind of you know, get to hear from Anne and to actually ask your questions. So we will make sure that we have plenty of time to do that. My assistant Rosalie is on the call. So if you have, if you're having any technical issues or, or anything, or you've got any kind of technical kind of questions, use the chat box, just type in there and Rosalie will be keeping an eye on that and will do her best to help you. I'm assuming everyone can hear me um, and see both Anne and I. So if maybe a couple of people could just type in the chat box to make 100% sure. So I haven't been rabbiting away to myself. That would be really helpful. Fabulous. Oh, wonderful. All right, great. Perfect. Brilliant. All right. So with that, and also I'd just like to let you know, we do have a mix of people on the call. So we've got business owners and entrepreneurs in the vegan and plant-based space. We've got representatives from corporations and retailers. And I know we've also got a number of investors. So welcome to all of you and from across the globe as well, which is wonderful. And I think to, that today's event is going to be valuable to all three of you. So without further ado, Anne, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much for having me, Katrina. I'm excited to do this. As I said to you on our pre-call yesterday, it's um, the first time I've done something to a pure, purely kind of vegan audience. So that's very exciting for me. Um, and it kind of shows what's happening in the world. We're now in that position. You know, when I started out 47 years ago uh, as a vegan, people didn't even know what it was. <laughs> so exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I really... To be honest, it's only um, up until five years ago, I used to say to people, I'm vegetarian and I don't eat dairy because they could, they didn't even understand what vegan was. So the, the change that we're seeing is just quite incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can see a couple of people have typed in. They can only see or somebody can't see Anne or they can only see me. Rosalie, can you um, figure out what's going on there? Um, and um, yeah. That's oh, we can see Anne now. Someone can say we can see Anne now. Oh, there we go. God for, thank <laughs> God for that. Because I got up early to look like this. <laughs> oh, hang on. I think it might be a speaker thing. Someone's saying they can only. Okay. So, Rosalie, I think we need to change the settings to whoever is actively speaking. Uh, oh, from that. Hang on. View. Here we go. Follow host view. Can you see both of us now? And can you speak? Can you see both of us when we speak? Got it. Okay. Little technical things. All, all good. All right. We're going to kick off. Thank God you're doing it, not me. I know. <laughs> Excellent. All good now. Fabulous. So, Anne, let's go back to the beginning. As you mentioned, 47 years you've been vegan. So, obviously, vegan from a very young age. You grew up in a remote part of Scotland. And your, I guess your business and your career journey actually started quite young. You ran away from home at 15 to escape domestic violence in the home, went to London, landed yourself a job at London's number one hairdressing salon and within a short space of time you were working on the heads and the hair of you know celebrities and royalty take us back to that time and just give us a bit of a uh, uh, an overview of, of what happened there 
Well, I'll actually dial back a little bit further because um, it really it was when I was three years old that I wanted to become vegan, not knowing what the word vegan meant, but I knew that I didn't want to eat anything that was dead. Um, one grandfather was a fisherman, so he was a deep sea sailor, and the other grandfather was a farmer. So, you know, I grew up with <laughs> death of animals and fish all around me. Um, and I remember one Sunday when I was three years old going to my grandmother's house for Sunday lunch and I was sitting at the table and I could see my grandfather's chickens through the window out in the field and my grandmother laid down this plate in front of me and she says, there's your chicken. And I remember looking and I said, is that the same as that? And she said, yes. And, I, and I, I remember from that moment on not wanting to eat meat. And every meal from the age of three until I was seven, I used to cry because I didn't want to eat what was in front of me. And I, it was, you know, it was distressing every, every single time I'd be asked and forced to eat meat. Then when I was seven years old, uh, my parents were so sick of me not eating um, my meals my mom dragged me off to the doctor for the umpteenth time. And um, there was a different doctor on from normal. Uh, it was a kind of, you know, a temporary doctor. And, and he said, instead of asking my mom what I ate, he said to me, so what do you like to eat? So I started listing all the you know, broccoli, carrots. Da, da, da. And he just turned to my mom and said, I don't see the problem. She just wants to be vegetarian. Um, wow. And <laughs> when we left, when we left the doctor's practice that day and walked home, my mom said to me, well, if you want to be vegetarian, you're going to have to cook all your meals from here on in yourself. So I did. From the age of seven, I actually cooked every single meal. My mom didn't cook any uh, or my dad. My, ironically, my father was a trained chef. <clears throat> so, you know, it was a very, very um, emotional thing for me. Uh, it wasn't, it's, it's never been about how, how, how you look or, you know, what's the latest Instagram. It's always for me been about animals. So that's where I sort of come from. It's I'm very much an ethical uh, vegan. And then for a long while, I kept eating um, dairy. I would have cheese. I didn't take yogurt or anything or milk, but I would have cheese. And then suddenly, when I was a little bit older, when I was about probably 12 or 13, I started to realize um, that, that that industry, what it was all about, and so stopped doing dairy as well. So it's been a very, you know, I'm probably vegan longer than some people in this call have been alive. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, and, I, and I remember making green juices. By the time I went to London, I would make these green juices and people would make fun of me who I was working with. They would think I was having a sludge. They'd go, that's, that's, that's pond water. What are you drinking that for? <laughs> you know, and of course, now they're all the, the same people who'd, who'd be wanting to have these juices. Um, so, you know, it was it was hard. It was really hard because I had to learn to cook at the age of seven. I ended up getting my own pots and pans, plates, knives, etc. I wouldn't even use the same utensils. I had my own shelf in the fridge, so I was like pretty vigilant about it. And um, and then I, as I got a little bit older, when I was about twelve or thirteen, I would actually go and campaign with placards and all sorts of things. So that, that's kind of where my kind of history comes from. And, and the house that I grew up in was domestic violence every day um, and a lot of neglect as well. So <clears throat> when I was 11, I started to save to run away. And, you know, I was 11 years old, so you're a kid. And I, in my head, I thought if I can get to a thousand pounds working after school and during school holidays, when I get to the thousand pound target, that's when, when I'm going to leave home. So it took me four years to get to that point. So at 15, I'd reached my thousand pounds. And probably from about the age of 13 to 15, I realized that I wanted to go and work in fashion. Um, I was working at the time in a local news agent to save this thousand pounds. And so I could see in all the fashion magazines, um, that maybe a way for me to get into fashion and work in magazines was to actually do the hair because the hair was being done for every cover and for every photo uh, shoot. So I started to then track which um, people were doing the hair, who was named the most frequently. And I created this kind of hit list of the top 10 hairstylists that kept getting listed. 
And the top of my list was a salon called John Frieda. And um, <clears throat> I thought, well, when I get to London, I'll go to John Frieda first. So I literally decided I left school um, without any exams, uh, jumped on a train. The day I was actually leaving to go, my mom <clears throat> didn't want me to go, obviously, um, but she had had a really bad violent attack from my father the night before. So she was so bruised that she couldn't even try and stop me leaving. Um, <clears throat> and then when I got to London, I didn't realise that people had Easter holidays because in Scotland we don't really do Easter, but in England they really do do Easter. So everything was shut down. And I was like, oh my God, I've arrived. Everything's shut down. It was the Easter weekend. And um, so then I had to wait to the Tuesday and I walked into John Frieda in the morning and I just said, at reception, can I have a job, please? <laughs> Not realising you're meant to apply <laughs> or do anything sensible to get a job. Um, and they kind of looked at me oddly and they said, look, you know, why don't you come back at uh, six o'clock and we'll give you an interview. So um, I went back at six o'clock, was interviewed by a hairstylist called Nikki Clark. And Nikki oh. Clark went on to become very famous himself. And that was the only job interview I ever had in my entire life. And so then he said, do a three-day trial. I did a three-day trial and then they gave me the job. And then very quickly, I was made into John Frieda's Jr. Within 10 days, I was given to John. And John, you know, Jr.'s usually lasted about a week to two weeks with John because he was, you know, he was an absolute workaholic. He did 18-hour days. But because I'd worked as a child from a very young age doing, you know, milk rounds, ironically, <laughs> you know, milk rounds, newspaper rounds, and working in a news agency, I had a very strong work ethic anyway. So him doing an 18 hour day for me was exhausting, but it was very viable. I was used to doing it. And um, so very, very quickly, I was surrounded by the upper echelons of society because the entire clientele that came into that salon and the photo shoots that I did with John as his assistant were all A-list celebrities or they were um, Hollywood stars, they were politicians, prime ministers of the day, they were, you know, uh, major, major players in business. So that was the people who I was around all the time. And I actually thought it was normal uh, to, if you wanted to, do, to record a record, you would tell me about the record and then six weeks later it was number one. Or if you were going to start a theatre show, um, I remember actually shampooing um, Tim Rice, who's a very well-known theatre producer. And, you know, he was, I was shampooing him and I, I never asked people about their holidays. I'd be always asking them what they're working on. And uh, I said, you know, what are you doing at the moment? He said, well, I'm thinking of doing this um, musical. It's about a woman who's from Argentina. And, you know, it's about her life and her name is Evita. Uh, so, you know, he would tell me all this before it ever happened. And then kind of like a year later, the show would be put on and, and Evita became very famous, obviously. So I would sort of hear all these, um, you know, the early seeds of what everybody was doing work-wise. And then I would, uh, then they would come back in. I would ask them, where are you with your project? And I would always remember what they were doing. And they, then they would tell me more. And so it went on. So um, very quickly through osmosis, I kind of absorbed that if you want to do something, it's a case of having the concept and the idea and then actually the steps that you need to take to make it happen. Mm. And probably the biggest learning curve for me was when John Frieda decided he wanted to launch his own hair care range. And at the time, the, the only other brand that was out there that was based on a branded named person was Vidal Sassoon. And Vidal Sassoon had kind of done it seven or eight years prior. Then nobody else had done it. Nobody else was on the landscape doing product under a person's name. 
So John was the next person. So I worked side by side with John from the age of 15 to 16, not only doing all these clients, but also working um, almost daily on his hair care range. I would, I would take the shampoos home and test them if they were too thick, too thin, did they have enough foam? Did they smell good? No. So every day I would be working on it with them to the point where we then went and did the presentation to Boots the Chemist, which is the biggest pharmacy in the UK. And, and they decided they wanted to take a product. So I worked on the actual physical development of the product. I worked on the packaging with him. I worked on the sales pitch to, to Boots the Chemist. And then I worked with uh, his PR and marketing people when the product actually launched. And that was all before I was 16 years old. Wow. So, you know, I had a pretty, um, I had a kind of fast track uh, master's in business by the time I was 16. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, but not from the normal way that you would do it. Um, and, you know, so that mix of kind of seeing a brand hatch and, and John's brand went on to become the most successful hair care brand at the time. And he sold it for 675 million kind of like 10 years later. Um, and, so, and then also I remember seeing a client, uh, um, a really well-known client was Anita Roddick as well. And I used to work with Anita doing photo shoots with her for the body shop. And then one day, one of the makeup artists was a woman called Barbara Daly. And Barbara ironically had done Princess Diana's makeup for her wedding among many other things, but I knew Barbara really well because I was on photo shoots all the time with her. So for the first time, Barbara and Anita Roddick had met on this photo shoot because Barbara had been sent to do Anita's makeup. Um, and we had Terry O'Neill doing the photographs, who's a famous photographer. And suddenly in this makeup room hatched this idea to do a line of a range of cosmetics for the body shop. And that went on to become Barbara Daly doing the makeup designs and colors. So then when they were developing the brands for the body shop, Barbara and Anita, they'd be sending me samples to try out, you know, do you like this eyeshadow? Do you like this lipstick? And I'd be getting all these early stage uh, developments sent to me. So, you know, it was, it was an incredibly exciting time. Um, looking back now, I realize how fortunate I was I didn't really understand because I was so young that it was all incredibly unusual. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Obviously meant to be, which I, I love. But then, so it's all happening. You've got this career in hair and fashion styling. You know, your career was really taking off. You're still quite young. Um, the Sunday Times positioned you, I believe, as the UK's fourth best hairstylist in the UK. Then you experienced a devastating accident that left you bedridden for a year um, and was actually the impetus to, to help you start your own business at the age of 23. But just tell us briefly what happened. Um, I was actually going home uh, to Scotland to see uh, extended family. And um, <clears throat> we were on a country lane at this point driving. My brother had come down to the airport to pick me up. You then have to drive another 120 miles because I grew up in the most northern tip of Britain where it's minus 22 in the winter. Uh, and that's 22 centigrade. Um, so, um, so we were driving along and, and there'd been uh, three cars in front of us all the time and a car behind for about 20 miles. And we just, there was nowhere to pass. And then suddenly a tractor uh, from a farm pulled out. The three cars in front stopped, we stopped, but the car behind us didn't and plowed into us at 70 miles an hour and rammed us into the, the other three cars. So um, I had really serious spinal injuries in, in um, several places and um, spent the next 11 months, 23 days and eight hours lying flat. <laughs> I can remember every hour of it. Um, and I didn't speak for the first four months. I was actually physically able to speak, but was in such shock that I chose not to speak, I guess. Mentally, I chose not to. Um, and then eventually, so people, you know, a family would come and see me all the time, but I actually just wasn't communicating because it felt like I was in locked-in syndrome. And um, 
And then John was trying to help. He was offering to get help from me. <clears throat> and then clients of mine stepped in. So Clark, Paul and Linda McCartney were very good client, clients of mine, but they were also good friends. Because again, this connection between vegan for me and you know vegetarian for them was unusual. So you know they they uh, connected with me when I was very young. I used to go to their home or their office and do their hair all the time. And in fact, I'll tell you a funny story about Stella McCartney because I remember Stella. Um, one day I had gone there to do John um, and uh, uh, sorry Paula and Linda. And their assistant, John, said to me when I arrived, look, you know, um, Linda's not here at the moment. She's actually out with Stella in Selfridges getting her ears pierced. <laughs> and so <laughs> when they came back, Stella had been to Miss Selfridge after getting her ears pierced and was carrying all these Miss Selfridge bags, so excited at all this fashion that she'd bought. Little did I know <laughs> when she was like 15 and I was about 18 or 19 or whatever, he or she was going to become this major fashion icon. Um, so, you know, and, and we know how amazing it is what she has done for the kind of, um, uh, for people to think about what they're, what they're buying when they're buying fashion. So that's kind of a side story. Anyway, um, so here I was, my car accident, not completely immobilized and uh, nobody really having an answer for how I was going to get walking again but I was convinced all the time that I would walk again and then Paul Linda McCartney stepped in particularly Linda and Anne we are going to fly you back down from Scotland I have found um, a guy who works with the Royal Ballet and we are going to get him to work with you to get you back walking so they flew me back down and then they paid for my treatment for the next two years. So they paid like 40,000 pounds, which is a lot of money now. It was even a huge amount more money back in those days. And um, from that, they, you know, that's what got me walking was their belief in me, their ability to take action and also find the right people. So not only did that show me that you can change the trajectory of your life by doing those kind of three things, but those three things also play out in business. It's not just, it's a whole, a whole light way of living, isn't it? That if you want something to happen, find a way to make it happen. And then I worked really hard, very hard at learning to walk again. It took me from the time of my accident to the time that I was able to walk on a flat surface was two years. It took another six months before I was able to climb the staircase. So it was, you know, full on. Wow. And so you obviously basically essentially because of your injuries, you weren't able to go back to that career. So not only do you have this devastating accident, you kind of lost that uh, part of your career that you obviously loved, but it also gave you the impetus to start your own business in property development. So tell us a bit about how that happened. Yeah, so um, John had said to me, you know, you can come back and work anytime you want, you know, next month, next year, five years, if you get to the point where you're able to work again and, and hair, come back. And at this point, you know, I've, I was doing fashion shows in New York, uh, you know, going to Paris and working with uh, Coco Chanel's, doing their couture, getting all the, doing all the catwalk shows, etc. So, you know, it was a, an exciting life. Um, if you watch The Devil Wears Prada, you know, I was kind of, I, I was doing that kind of life around those people that, that I, when I watched that film, I was just like, oh my God, that was everything I experienced when I was young. Um, so what happened next was I um, got married very quickly, <laughs> met somebody, uh, and then um, 10 days later, we got married. And that did last 30 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we're still incredibly good friends. So um, when we got married, I was like, okay, I'm going to find somewhere to live. So we're going to buy something and I'll do it up. And this was when it was the recession in the 80s. So people were losing money right, left and centre and managed to get a really good deal on a property um, and moved into, it wasn't that 
badly done up inside, but it did need new kitchens, bathrooms, etc. And so I, uh, as a form of recuperation, started to oversee this being done up and do quite a lot of it myself just by reading books and kind of okay this is how I do this and I would you know go and make the renovation happen so when it was finished nine months later I was physically stronger mentally stronger um, and friends said to me why don't you put this in the market it looks amazing and I was like well I didn't do it to put it on the market but okay I'll put it in the market and see what happens and again, everybody was, we were still deep in recession and people losing money. Suddenly I then had, when I did put it on the market, I had a huge amount of people wanting to buy it. And one of the people who wanted to buy it was Kate Moss. I had a guy called JK from Jamaraquai, the band. And then I also had Alexandra Schulman, who was the editor of Vogue, wanting to buy it. So in the end, Alexandra Schulman put in uh, an asking price offer, which nobody was doing in those days. She kind of did that offer on something like a Wednesday. So we started the process on a Wednesday to, for her to buy it. But she then went off to the catwalk shows in Paris at the weekend. And so she was in Paris the whole of the following week. In those days, people didn't have mobile phones. So, and you also keep showing property in the UK. Even though you have an offer, you keep showing it because people pull out all the time. So I kept showing it. And then this other guy came along, an American, and he offered a huge amount more money for the property. So I then went back trying to get hold of Alexander Schulman, the editor of Vogue, to say, look, this guy has offered me tens of thousands more than you're offering, way over the asking price. Uh, but I couldn't get hold of her. So then I tried to get hold of her then boyfriend at the time because I had his contact details. He was a journalist, got hold of him, but then he also couldn't get hold of her because she was going from catwalk show to catwalk show. So by the following Wednesday, we hadn't managed to get hold of her and our boyfriend hadn't got hold of her. So I ended up selling the property to this American guy who paid a lot more money for it. And he um, exchanged on the Wednesday and on the Friday we completed. So by the Friday, I was actually homeless. <laughs> so all the stuff went into storage. And, and afterwards, I thought, oh, my God, if I ever want to go back and work in fashion, I have so just shot myself in the head because I will never work with Vogue again. <laughs> so, um, and, and so I thought, yeah, but I've got a bigger bank balance than I had before. And uh, so... On the following Monday, so now kind of like two Mondays have gone by from when I'd last, from, from when we sort of started doing stuff with Alexandria to buy it, she rang me. She got, she, I had left a message with her partner saying, you know, this is, this is a house I'm going to be staying at. I want to apologize to her, blah, blah, blah. Um, so she rings me and she doesn't say anything other than she gets on the phone and she goes, you know, it's Alexandra Shulman. I want your next one. And I went, my next war and she says I want to buy your next property and I was like oh oh, oh okay <laughs> sort of like didn't really understand and then kind of put the phone down and I thought hang on a minute here maybe there's a business in doing this <laughs> so then I actually started to do property and that's how I started my property development business it wasn't intentional but very quickly it grew. So um, within the first year, it was turning over 17 million pounds. I was 23 years old. I had 40 uh, tradies working for me. Um, and then another eight, 80 odd trades that would come in and do specific jobs. And very, very quickly, I developed this A-list clientele of people like um, Annie Lennox and Elton John and, and, you know, Sting and all these people were my clients. So um, I was buying and renovating property of my own as well as doing properties for clients. So that was kind of the next major stage for me. That's really interesting because one of the things, and I know I think you, you've mentioned this once before, is that you knew nothing about property development. Like you said, you kind of fell into it. So, and I think that brings up one of the key strategies that I know you talk about um, that business owners should do, but a lot of a lot of them don't. Can you tell us a bit about that and the importance oh, of it? Delegation. Yeah. Delegation <laughs> is like the number one thing. You know, like the reason 
um, that I was successful doing property development. And I ended up doing over 500 odd properties of my own and over 120 client properties. And they were valued from about a million pounds up to 80 mil 82 million pounds, uh, all, all domestic properties. So I've done a lot of property in my time. And um, the number one thing is to delegate. Like I have no idea how to plumb a, a toilet or how to uh, hang a light as an electrician, uh, how to chase at a wall, how to lay flooring, any of that stuff which is great because what you have to become is extremely good at instructing people as to what you want to have done. You have to become an, an amazing communicator. You have to be able to, I mean, I think one of the, the things that most small business owners make a mistake with is thinking that people understand what's in their head. No, no, what's in your head is only in your head. And the only way that you're gonna get what you want is by able to communicate what's in your head to your teams, uh, whether that's your staff or third parties, you're not going to get results on anything in business unless you are a super good communicator. So if that means you drawing stuff or writing stuff or using, you know, um, particular productivity uh, programs, whatever it takes to make your projects happen and your ventures happen, you have to be uh, an amazing communicator. Absolutely. And I think you, we touched on this when we had a bit of a chat yesterday about founders as well, not finding it hard to delegate, thinking they've got to do it all themselves. And actually, that can actually sabotage the business. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, you have to become an air traffic controller, not a doer. So you have to be able to point, become very good at pointing. <laughs> because that's, um, great. that's a great little even if, as it, <laughs> even if it's kind of mentally pointing, whether on the phone or on a Zoom call, it's not actually physically doing the stuff. It's getting other people who are experts in the field to do the stuff for you. The minute you're doing stuff to save money, that's going to lead to failure. My, my father had um, a small convenience store and you know, his whole way of operating was to do everything himself, absolutely everything. And he um, was doing, you know, very, very long hours and ended up dying from overwork uh, in, in his mid-50s. So I've seen the wrong way of doing business and then I've experienced the right way of doing business. And even people who are very successful often need reminded, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that bit. Tell somebody what you want done or tell them, you know, find somebody who has that expertise because they're going to know how to do it better than you do. I love it. That's such good advice. Now, I believe you were able to sell one of your businesses with a retail value of just under a billion dollars. Can you tell us a bit about that? How did you do that? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, the interesting thing for me, I think, with businesses, it takes as much work to make, say, $30,000 a year as it does to make $30 million a year. There's only a certain amount of hours in a day. And then it takes not a lot more to go up the ladder because what most people do is, if you think of business as a ladder, most people are only reaching the, for the first two or three bars. They don't think that actually, at the top, it's actually a pretty empty space. You don't have a huge amount of competition and it's not as hard as you think to get to the top, but you don't necessarily have to climb every rung of the ladder to get to the top. You can actually jump, literally take massive steps and leaps up. So obviously when you're starting out, you know, you're in your head, you might be going, oh, it'd be really great if I can reach, you know, 3 million a year. And then when you've reached 3 million a year, you go, oh, 30 million. And then 30 million becomes 300 million. And, you know, 300 million then is like, oh, well, why not, why not 600 million? Um, but by that time, you've kind of gone through a long process of thinking these steps through, thinking you have to do all this in a particular way. But if you actually study some of the most successful businesses at the moment, they are using investors who are, who are, um, buying into the belief of what that business is going to do. Um, and, you know, I've got very good friends who, if I go, if I wind the clock back, I actually looked up the date when I, when I first met them. It was 15 years ago I started to um, know 
Scott Farquhar and Mike Cannon Bowles from Atlassian. Now, Atlassian are a software company. They're one of the most successful companies in Australia. And Mike and Scott, who are the founders, are still very young, but they are in the top two or three richest uh, people in Australia. And when I first met them 15 years ago, <clears throat> at that point, they were still young and their business was kind of worth about 10 million. And I was the chair of the judges for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards for Australia. So I was chair in the Australian Awards. And they had got through to the, the final part. <clears throat> and it's actually a big deal when you're doing this judging process for Ernst & Young. You're not allowed to talk to the other judges. Everything's very secretive. And, but at the final stages, you know, I had to chair this table of really renowned business owners in Australia where we were deciding who would actually win the award for that year. And you had a very well-known makeup company, it was Australia. You had a medical company that's gone on to do amazing things with COVID at the moment. And, um, and also you had Atlassian. And what was interesting, most of the people in that room, and there were at least 12 really high-flying business owners making that, those decisions about who was going to win, they didn't understand what Atlassian were doing. They really did not. And I had to try and explain to them what their software was going to do, how it was changing business, et cetera. And I, because I was kind of one of the youngest in the room uh, and the rest of them were um, older business owners who were seeing things in an older viewpoint. And Eventually, we got it down to two that we thought should win, either Atlassian or another company. And ultimately, I again kept pushing for I felt that Atlassian should win. And I didn't know Scott and, and Mike at this point. I'd only interviewed them. I hadn't you know, built any kind of personal relationship with them. So in the end, everybody decided that Atlassian should win. So when they won that award 15 years ago, they were valued at 10 million. And I just looked up before we started the call, in October of this year, the company is now worth 75 billion. <laughs> and I have to say that I taught Scott how to kayak, him and his wife how to kayak. <laughs> so, <laughs> so afterwards, we got very friendly. And to watch them grow has been you know, fascinating because they entered a market where they were able to spread fast. They got the right people in at the right time to help them with that growth. They did not know all the roadmap to doing this. They got the right expertise in at the right time. And they created an amazing culture to work in. So that culture has made their business this incredible success. So when most small business owners are you know, envisaging what they want to do with their venture, they generally play way too small. They generally are almost taking it from hobby into reality and, and it's a big deal if they're pushing it any further. So first of all, don't do business if you just want to have a hobby. If you really want to do entrepreneurship, then you've got to be able to take really good thoughtful risks you've got to understand how to get the right teams around you if you don't know how to do it find people that can help you and then you've got to test 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 your market like people do not test stuff i don't understand it you know when, when, even when i still do stuff today for myself not even for clients we are testing stuff for months, sometimes a year before we launch it, because we want to finesse it properly to get it right. And a lot of people say, no, 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 don't, don't uh, get caught up in perfectionism. I'm not talking about perfectionism here. I'm talking about not pouring your money down the toilet. <laughs> like, you've got to get the product or service right so that you don't go broke in the process. Then when you've got it right, and I'm not talking about perfection, because things always need changed and, and evolved and adapted, even when you launch them. 
But once you've actually done that, you've got to do a tremendous amount of testing because people make assumptions all the time about who their marketplace are, who's going to buy it, is the price point right? You know, it just goes on and on. And they don't ever actually base that on real examples that show them the facts. Mm. That's really important. I'm glad you shared that. You've answered one of my questions, which was about some of the key mistakes that, that businesses make and that brands make. Let's take us back to, so you, you're still in the UK. It was the late 90s, the early 2000s. You've developed your property development. You've become known as an interior designer. You've sold millions of copies of your book. Uh, you've launched a homewares range with over 1,600 SKUs of product. You've got your own show on the BBC. The New York Times have dubbed you the Martha Stewart of the UK you're about to sign a massive deal with a US TV network which would have literally blown up your personal brand on a global basis but something happened and you ended up walking away moving to the other side of the world to Sydney Australia where you're now based and out of the public eye for a few years what happened and how has this impacted you um you condensed a lot of it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like it was over a 10 year period so let's let's not kind of mislead as if that all could have happened in one sort of year but yes that was those were all the things that were happening to me um and yeah, you know, the, the, my own product range launching that was a huge deal so I was the first person in the UK to do branded homeware that was under a person's name my name um I got that into all the major retailers um and the other thing about the products that I had, everything was environmentally friendly, but people didn't even realize it. I was doing mass market product, but making sure that the cushion pads weren't feather cushions, that they were filled cushions without feathers. I was making sure there's no um, shells being used, you know, all the things like cushions. Uh, the bedding was all water-based inks. All my paint range was the, the low the first time anybody had done a low VOC paint range, nobody had ever given a shit about it before. And suddenly I'd created this entire paint range and line of paint that you could go and um, there were like 30 odd colors that you could paint your home with that were ready to go. So I, I, I broke new ground in lots and lots of areas with that homeware range, which is why it became valued in retail, you know, at, at the price that it did. So the... Um, the thing that kind of changed everything, I was on TV for 10 years with the BBC. And I, uh, one, the very first show that I did was with um, a well-known presenter, presenter called Kevin McLeod. Kevin and McLeod does a show called Grand Designs. So Kevin and myself started on TV on the same program on the same day. Um, and he's still doing it. I'm not. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we used to we worked together for almost ten years. And then I also had my own shows, and I had a chat show as well. So I did lots and lots of TV, and was well known. And because of my red hair, um, I was pretty recognisable when I'd go down the street, and I have quite a recognisable voice as well. So you know, I was what people term a celebrity, and um, <clears throat> which is kind of a really weird world being a celebrity. It's a whole other, it's a whole other webinar. Um, (laughs) So um, at that point, I was very high profile in the UK and I got a phone call one morning and I was a very good friend of a a newsreader and a TV presenter called Jill Dando. And we uh, had met at some parties at the BBC at Throne. And one morning I got this very strange phone call on my mobile and this guy was telling me he knew where I lived, what I did, what times I did things at. And he named one other presenter and he said, you know, you guys watch out. It was a disturbing call. Put the call down, phone down. And I I thought, well, I can't ring this other presenter at the moment, I'll, um, I'll ring her at lunchtime. So at lunchtime, uh, my team, we would all have lunch together and switch the news on. And I switched the news on and not the person who'd been named in this call was not Jill Dando, it was another presenter, but Jill Dando, who I knew, had been shot dead outside her front door. And 
then the British press were looking for who's the shit you're going to get next. So I became the target through the press of saying that the shooter was going to come after me next. So they were inciting the shooter to come after me. Um, it's a very strange feeling when you, uh, that by this point of being a celebrity, I didn't used to buy the newspapers because half the time what they write about you is complete shit. So you, you don't want to read it. Uh, but a friend rang up on a Sunday and said, you've got to go and buy every paper today. <laughs> every Sunday paper. I was like, I don't want it. So I, my husband went out and got every Sunday paper. And I was the front cover. Of, I was the whole front cover of every Sunday paper. And then I was two or three pages inside for each paper as well. So it's all, all about seven or eight newspapers. And it was this entire thing how I was now living in fear. And my house had become a fortress. And, you know, the shooter was coming after me. Uh, one journalist had sold that story to all the papers um, and they each done their own version of it. So after that, then I had to get protection. And um, for the next two, so they, they caught somebody for the Jill Dando shooting, but they discovered later that he was the wrong person and had to release him. So for about two years, I, I was living, looking over my shoulder every single day wasn't a pleasant experience. And um, I ended up with post-traumatic stress disorder because of it. And I decided that, you know, I would, I couldn't kind of live with how I was feeling every day, um, waiting to be gunned down. <laughs> it's not a pleasant feeling. <laughs> um, so I then decided I would leave being a celebrity, live below the radar, moved to the other side of the world. I loved Australia. I mean, I, I came to Australia 30 years ago on holiday, um, but it was a decision to come here in part for, to, for my security. And then when I uh, decided I was no longer going to be a public eye, I didn't do any interviews for 20 years. I've only done probably five interviews since. Uh, and this is, I think, only my third webinar in 20 years. So it still has a big impact on me all these years later. It's 22 years ago now. So, um, yeah, it, it was life changing. It was life changing because, again, it's like it's like you lost one thing when you had your accident and then you had this happen. How have you kind of cope? Like, so you can because coming from and as I've done this you know, come from the UK, moving country, especially that mm. distance is quite big. But to actually go from, like you say, you know, having this really successful career, being in the public eye, and then suddenly, you know, doing something completely the opposite. So how did you kind of handle that, I guess, that loss, and I guess still, you know, the impacts of the PTSD, and start up a business advisory and still continue to do work that you did? Um, God, it was hard. I mean, I, I, there was a massive relief uh, arrived in Australia. And I remember I had never been on public transport in London for about 12 years because of being a celebrity. Because uh, I just, it was, it was too difficult because people would just come up to you constantly. And I'd used public transport prior to being, being known. And um, so then when I arrived in Sydney, I actually didn't buy a car for the first six months. I was like, I want to sit in a bus again. I want to sit in a ferry. I want to be able to be normal again. Um, and I remember about probably four months after I was here, I was sitting on a ferry because I used to live right beside a ferry stop. And the guy who was the kind of like the conductor on the ferry, I don't know what they're called conductors, but he was the, the person checking your tickets. He went... Oh, that white room you did on TV a year ago or three years ago, that was amazing. And I remember just having gone into complete panic attack because I was like, oh, shit, somebody knows who I am. They know I'm here. And, and it was just like really horrible yeah. feeling. In the end, he was a conductor I would see on a regular basis. And I eventually learned to calm down when I would see him. <laughs> and then we would always end up chatting. But, you know, that panic is kind of there all the time. And, and I also kind of gave up work because I'd sold my business. And that's also kind of weird because you work for years and years and years building a brand, um, sold a business, did very well financially from it. But now you're like, well, 
what the hell do I do now? I guess it's like empty nester syndrome, except it's a business. It's not a child. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've grown this thing for years. Um, and I was like, okay, so like, literally, who am I? What, what, what am I going to do next? Um, so for the first six months, I kind of retired. Um, thought, oh, I don't need to work anymore. Um and did lots and lots of charity stuff, set up my own foundation, was doing microfinance before people really knew what microfinance was. And after six months, I was like, okay, microfinance is great. Doing st charity stuff is great, but this is not enough for me. Like I haven't spent my whole uh, life being in fifth gear to now be in first gear. It just doesn't, it's not working for me as a person. Um, and then a friend of mine contacted me at the Blue in the UK, who's a celebrity, and said, can you build a brand for me the way that you built a brand for yourself? So I started to build their brand then. And within probably four or five months, then I had lots of very well-known celebrities, particularly Hollywood A-list celebrities, approach me saying, you know, I, I'm doing this. I'm known for film, but I want to build a, you know, build a brand. So somebody like Gwyneth Paltrow, um, I started working with Gwyneth when her Goop blog just had six staff on it. And, uh, you know, now she's got 350 staff and it's, and it's worth, you know, a fortune. Uh, but, you know, in the early days, it was just her doing, um, doing this blog and trying to feel where she was going to bring that brand. And then also I worked with Tracy Anderson, who was a partner of hers in a gem and growing Tracy Anderson's brand from just being Tracy doing some DVDs into the whole brand kit. And then next I had uh, Australia's best known fitness person, Michelle Bridges, asking me to grow her brand. And then, you know, she became the biggest fitness person and biggest fitness brand here in Australia. So, you know, taking all these personalities, um, and a lot of celebrities feel slightly frustrated because they might be known as, you know, the Grammy Award winning singers uh, or the Oscar winning actors, but they've got this whole entrepreneur side to them that they want to explore. So, you know, you kind of done stuff with Beyonce and Jay-Z, um, you know, taking the uh, vegan line of product that they've done and expanding on that and giving advice on that in the very early days. So, you know, it's, it's been a really fascinating journey because I've taken everything that I learned really from John Frieda and a little bit of what I learned from working with Anita Roddick and The Body Shop and then doing my own brand and then taking that and expanding massively. Um, but also having big corporates come asking for advice. You know, the Walmarts, the Marks and Spencers, the Tesco's, the Commonwealth Bank here in Australia, uh, all the big Fortune um, 50 companies, uh, car companies, Mercedes, et cetera, I've worked with to want to have an insight that's not your standard insight. I don't really think in a standard way because I didn't go through the normal education process. I mean, I was uh, literally <laughs> brought up in the street and then I learned entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, entrepreneurship on the street is a whole different thing from what you learn in university. So when I was asked by Harvard to join their leadership board, um, I then started to lecture at Harvard as well with all their MBA students and what they were being taught in these books was just didn't really relate to real business. So every time I would go over to Boston and do stuff with them, I'd be inundated by hundreds and hundreds of mature students, because mainly it's mature students doing an MBA, and uh, wanting to know real life business advice. That's really an interesting point. So before we, we're getting close to kind of opening up to some, some audience questions, but can you give us, I know you've touched on this in terms of testing, that was a, a major thing, and delegation. What would be one or two of your key tips for building a brand that you can share with us? Um, first thing is, is the marketplace, you want to go into a good marketplace, are you going to make money in it? So first you have to look at if there's anybody already in that marketplace, kind of how well is their business doing? Um, then it's deciding, you know, 
what kind of brand you want. And, you know, even people who have done business sometimes in the past, when they come to set up their new business, they might get the business name wrong, <laughs> which is a pretty major thing to get wrong. Because if somebody, if your brand name um, can be pronounced many different ways, for example, that's not smart because it's going to mean that people aren't going to necessarily say the name in the correct way and you'll have variations of the brand name being said. Um, and then the actual brand itself beyond, you know, things like logos and stuff is obviously, you know, you have to um, make sure that uh you're really understanding that marketplace. So I am probably the most anal researcher you will ever find in your life. I don't do that. I do have researchers I pay as well sometimes, but I am a huge researcher. I research the hell out of everything before we go and do it. So when I'm working with clients and we're, you know, looking to either launch something they want or evolve something they've got or add to what we're doing. I am researching everything before we go and do it um, and finding out the best ways to do it. So I would say the I've done a project right now that's going to conclude in two weeks' time. <clears throat> hasn't gone as well as it should because the person who was looking after the process like the project's going to be successful uh we already know it's because people buy the, the business already um but the process and doing that i left to somebody um who owns a business and was convincing that they understood how to map this process out and I actually said to them yesterday, um, when, when and if you sell this business in two or three months' time, because they've been offered a huge amount of money for it already, and if you want to do the next one, we're doing the next one differently. We're not, I'm not going to allow you next time around to tell me that you know how to do all this stuff because I've seen that you don't and you need more expertise and to help you. So it does come down to surrounding yourself with good people. But knowing, you know, like so many times I've worked with clients who are the founders of their business, they conceptualized it originally, they're running the show, but they get to a point uh, about four or five years ago, I had to say to three separate clients, and it was all in one year that's happened as well. Three separate clients, I'd say to them, you need to fire yourself as a CEO. You aren't skilled enough anymore to be the CEO of this brand. The brand has outgrown you. You aren't, you aren't skilled enough and you don't understand how to do this next stage and you need somebody on board who does. And in each of those cases, it took almost nine months to a year to get from that initial conversation to a new CEO coming on board each time because it's like saying to somebody, you're not a good parent. Like you need somebody to come in and parent your child. So it's a hard conversation to have, but it's one that often needs to happen. Mm, I love it. Some good tips there. Now I know you've obviously been um, running your own um, a business advisory service for A-list celebrities and you know um, personality driven entrepreneurs and corporations but you're also about to be launching something called Plant Future which is specifically to help uh, people within the vegan and plant-based space so the three audiences that we mentioned at the beginning business owners small business owners and entrepreneurs investors and also the corporations and retailers do you want to just briefly tell us about that before we open it up to some audience yeah, questions so Plant Future for me started really kind of two years ago. It was in 2019. Um, plantfuture.com is the website at the moment. And um, it's basically a sister advisory. Uh, my main advisory company is called MDPC Global, which was an acronym for a much bigger name originally. And um, so MDPC Global has looked after all these celebrity clients and uh, grown all these brands. And then I was getting more and more clients in the plant-based business. And originally, 
plant future kind of sat within that, within MDPC Global. But it's got to the point two years ago, I thought, you know what, I actually need to have plant future as its own advisory. So we're not doing anything like telling people how to go and make a vegan souffle or um, <laughs> how to make vegan food or anything like that. What we do is we are working with companies across the board uh, and investors who want to either expand their offering in the plant-based world or launch an offering or look to extra markets for them. And for investors, you know, investors looking um, for us to help them insight which companies they should be investing in um, and, and having that early stage understanding of, you know, this is a good company to be looking at and thinking about. So, you know, I've got um, people I've worked with a lot who run a company called Immaculate Vegan and they're in the UK. They've got a really great uh, vegan shopping site and, you know, someone like them, they're now at the stage where uh, we're going out looking to get them investors and help them with that investment. Um, and then the other part that really struck me is that small business owners, if I'm going to help the vegan industry fast track stuff, then I also have to fast track all the small business owners to make sure that they're set up in the best possible way to make sure that the business they're doing is something that can scale up and really take on the, the meat and dairy industries. If they're in food, they can take on the fashion industry. If they're in fashion, if they're in hospitality, they're offering something that, you know, hospitality transfer, whatever industry you're in and you want to, to do that with your small business, then you can do that with more expertise and knowledge. So I am setting up for small business kind of a series of online programs, <clears throat> which I'll actually teach and they will launch in August. And then I'm also going to do a um, kind of intense mastermind um, group, which will be a kind of a three month group. And then it, it will expand for longer if we want that to go on longer. So it will allow small business owners to be better placed for investors there's a marriage there to be had with really good um, small businesses and investors who are looking for good businesses. And then for retailers, if they're also looking for what, what should they be stocking more of in, in any area, in beauty, we have done a lot with beauty brands as well that are vegan. So just making sure that we touch and cover all those areas and fast track the industry even more than it is. I mean, I I never in a million years thought that I'd be sitting having the kind of conversations I'm having these days about vegan product and vegan services. Um, it just, I didn't think we'd get here in my lifetime. Me neither. Uh, I always make a joke that yeah. I never thought I'd be cool and trendy because I still love disco, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I just it's, it's fascinating to me because it's literally up until five years ago, I used to say to people, as I said earlier on the call, well, I'm vegetarian, but I don't eat dairy because nobody knew what vegan was. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of um, it's really humbling to see how the speed this has taken off. And I think also with COVID, it's actually had an even bigger impact because suddenly people who weren't necessarily so socially conscious before, um, are kind of it, socially consciousness has kind of been pushed on them whether they like it or not. And once you become generally more socially conscious, you start seeing other things that maybe you didn't see before as well. And I think a lot of um, retailers are obviously seeing there is big bucks in this. There is a whole marketplace out there. And now, when you sit on a plane or you buy a car, you don't want necessarily a car, a Mercedes that's got leather seats. You don't want um, you don't want to uh, get on a plane and they scramble to find you something to eat, or that you're sitting in a leather seat on the plane. So <clears throat> it's having that influence across the board. So. You know, I, I originally sat down probably three or four years ago and thought, okay, I, I really want to do something big in the vegan world. Doing my own business is going to limit how much I can do. Whereas if I help as many businesses and as many 
enterprises and as many investors as possible, what I can do is kind of multiplied by 100 or 500, time will tell. Um, but that to me is really exciting. At this stage of my life, it's about the legacy I can leave behind to make sure that as few animals on this planet suffer by making sure we make the change that we all want. Wonderful. I love it. And I'm just, I think it's just brilliant that we've got someone like you focusing on doing this. So you, um, people will get an email from me with a link to Plant Future, but as um, Anne said, is plantfuture.com. There is a landing page up at the moment where you can go and sign up um, to receive more information. So I'm going to open it up to some audience questions. This is your chance to um, ask Anne um, a question. So there's going to be two ways we're going to do it because I want to make it as accessible for people as possible. So if you would prefer to just type your question into the chat or the Q&A, you can do that and I'll read your question out and Anne will respond. Alternatively, if you would like to speak your question with words, um, you please use the raise hand button. There's like a little button that says raise hand and I will come to you and um, allow you to talk. So I will try and go between the, the chat and the Q&A and the raised hand. So I can see we've got a Daniel Weisberg. Daniel has a, um, raised your hand. So Daniel, I am going to allow you to talk just so that we can get through as many questions as possible. If you can just briefly say who you are and what your business is and then um, ask your question um, rather than kind of ramble on too much, just so that we can get a few questions in, um, that will be great. So Daniel, I'm going to allow you to talk. What's your question, Daniel? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Anne and Katrina. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Uh, my company is called Clean South, um, and we make vegan chicken wings from scratch in Los Angeles. And my question is, you know, doing it that way, um, you know, we, my wife and I don't believe in using processed ingredients, and we make everything by hand. And we just recently got our first, first co-packer. Um, which is, you know, has been very costly, but has been something that we need to do to take the business to the next level. So um, my question is, how can I communicate to our potential customers our value proposition? Because our product is one of the highest priced ones in our category, but it's also because, you know, we're making it by hand and not using processed ingredients. Um, so it's just been, I feel like it's been a little bit difficult to communicate that to people when in the grocery stores, you know, customers are generally looking for the lowest price possible. Um, well, as you'll know, be aware, Daniel, in the food industry, there is various tiers of pricing in almost any um, anything you buy, whether it's a soup or a, or a, um, a yogurt or whatever it is all different price points. So the, the key thing here for you, or for anybody in a similar circumstance, is going to be about getting the brand message correct. That's both on the product packaging, because that's the thing the customer is seeing. And then that has to link to your website and your socials and the marketing PR that you do. So ultimately, most people I find don't spend nearly enough either time or money on PR and marketing. Once you've actually kind of built the product or the service, really 70%, 70% of your time has to be spent on marketing and PR, getting that message out there um, and doing it in such a way that it makes people go to store to get your product. They write down that they want to get your product. Um, and for those that aren't writing down that they want to get your product, then it's actually when they're in store, they're picking up the package and the package is got messaging on it that is explaining the story to them mm -hmm. so that they kind of go, OK, it's not processed, it's handmade. So all those things have to be your key messages within your branding. Um, and you have to become either you or somebody becomes a major spokesperson for the brand. Plus, you want as many influencers as you can afford to get because, you know, you, you have to end up paying for that, a lot of that these days. Uh, but as many people talking about your product as possible and, and, and being smart and clever about how to grab media attention. OK, great. Excellent. Thanks. So much. Thank Thanks you. for your question. Great. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I'm going to come to 
Oh, Samantha, Samantha from Flave. Um, let me click allow to talk. Hi, Sam. Good morning. Thank you, Katrina, so much for organising uh, this morning. I'm glad I got up bright eyed and bushy tailed because my notepad is filled. So thank you so much, Anne, as well. Thank you, Danielle. I guess Sorry, I'm going to your wrong name, Samantha. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I've just spoken to Daniel. Now we're doing Samantha. So um, my husband and I, we're just about to launch a plant-based uh, concept called Flav. And essentially it's, um, I guess, taking on the fast casual market. There's a lot of product innovation, but we feel like the distribution of food isn't as strong in the celebra celebration of plant-based food. And we really want to make plant-based food easy, convenient, and exactly what our name stands for, flavorful. Because we find that people who want to make the switch, unless they have a known alternative, like a burger or a bowl that they can relate to, then sometimes they see plant-based food as boring and bland. And we really, really want to challenge that. So you've already touched on it a little bit in the answer that you just gave previously about, you know, the PR aspect of it. And I guess Stuart and myself, we think we have a very strong brand. We're about to enter the marketplace. And I want to ask you a personal question. I guess hearing your story now, your celebrity aspect yourself, the, the personal brand that you had for yourself, do you think that that was integral for the products and the services that you offered and that someone should internally be the spokesperson being the founder or should you give that potentially to someone else who specialises in being the spokesperson for the brand versus the founders? Uh, oh, generally, I would say to people, uh, be your own uh, ambassadors. Um, mm -hmm. Unless somebody is completely tongue-tied and not good at talking, which clearly you are because you've just you know, spoken well for the last couple of minutes. Um, um, and I'm aware of your brand, as, as you'll know. So, um, so, you know, the main thing is that somebody has to become that talking head. Mm. So that you can do the radio shows, you can talk to the media, you can be the person that gets up on stage and talks, you can bring out the book, you can do all the different things that are part of brand building. Um, you know, most people think that um, when you're doing brand building, it's always about the specific thing you have. So in your case, you know, fast, casual, casual food, but it's, it's more than that. So I've got a client who I won't name, um, and, you know, this client is very, very smart, uh, constantly talking in the media about things that grab attention and get global coverage because um, they're generally of a sexualized nature intentionally. <laughs> um, <laughs> You've got us all curious now. There's all sorts going on in our minds now. Um, you know, so, you know, this person sells a lot of different products on their website, but it's always particular products that get the media attention and they are brought out to get media attention. <laughs> so, like, it's not to they get sales from it, but it drives constant consumers going to the, the website because the press are writing about a candle or they're writing about a particular kind of stone or they're writing about whatever. Um, so that drives people to that particular brand. For something like your brand or anybody else who's listening who's got a brand that's doing handbags or doing food or whatever it is, as a vegan brand, your story is always bigger than just the food and the taste. Um, and, and that's where you have to become the person who's out there talking about that. And, and unfortunately, most PR companies only understand basic PR, even if they say they understand how to build brands. Generally, they don't, because I kind of go, well, what brands have you actually built? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas a, a, a true um, kind of uh, company or person who can kind of help get behind that has to look at the whole thing that you're doing. It's the whole story. And it's, it's kind of the difference between looking at the planet and seeing a country versus seeing all the planet. And most PR companies just see the product. Um, 
and they don't necessarily see the whole planet that's there around them. And I will say it's not just a planet. We have all these moons orbiting us in a PR and marketing drive. And you have to use everything very cleverly to drive audiences to, in your case, your uh, fast food uh, casual eating venue. And then if you want to grow that brand further into multiple venues, then you've also got to be doing stuff on a different level that's an investor level. Uh, and a lot of key decisions you'll make about messaging are one is for your customer and then other PR or marketing is to attract investors. So I've got, a, I've got a client that's got a care home business and she's created this very, very different type of care home business. Um, called New Direction Care. You can go on to newdirectioncare.com.au. And um, she created all these micro care homes. Instead of it being one big building, there are 17 homes or 19 homes within the, the complex. And it's, it's all, everything's done differently. So for her to attract investors, we were doing... PR and marketing on different levels so that she's attracting residents to want to live there. And generally that's a decision made by women in their fifties for a family member that needs to go into a care home. And then the other part was we were doing strategic PR and I was getting her to do public speaking and we have been working on a book and that's to attract investors so that she can grow faster. So you have to map out what you actually want for your brand. And then you have to break it down into how you're going to achieve that and what messaging are you sending out at different levels for the different people who need to hear your story. Mm. Yeah, because I feel like sometimes you, we can put so much time and attention into the brand or the service that obviously we, we want to market. And then as that grows, obviously from a founder's perspective, you do have to invest in yourself if you are the chosen spokesperson as well, because all too often you can be thrown in the limelight, but there's a sense of polishing that in some ways as well and having a oh, absolutely. I, I've got yeah. a client right now who, I don't know, she might even be on this call because she is vegan. Um, she, we are rebranding her right now. I've been working with her for over a year and I've actually known her for 10 years. We have worked with her and she did a course of mine many years ago. And I've, I've kept in touch and then started working with her properly uh, a year ago. And for the last couple of weeks, I've been planning here in Sydney, her photo shoot in London. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow she is getting a haircut and color under my instruction to the hairstylist that I've told her to get her haircut with. She's then using the photographer I want, the makeup artist, etc. We picked locations last night on a, photo, on a Zoom call. Um, and then we're working with the stylist and how she'll be dressed. And then because I can see the location that she's going to be shot in, in this particular house, I will work with the photographer and say, that's the shot I need of her by that window. This is what I need here. And the whole thing has been done remotely, but we are planning her entire rebirth as a, as a brand. Um, and then we're doing that because she's launching a whole brand new online program that is in the diet area. And she will be completely transforming um, people in Britain and around the world with this advice she has. But we have to, you know, it's, it's staged. We have to get her looking right first. Then we have to get with that set of photography, build the website. We have to do a book. She has to do public speaking. I've taken so many clients who are really, really well-known um, actors, and I've had to work with one of my speaker trainers with them to teach them how to do public speaking, how to respond to the media in an appropriate way so that you're not just answering their question, you're actually getting your brand story out there. So it's, it's a lot more to it than just, oh, I'll employ a PR company. But it's all achievable. You know, anybody can do it. Um, it just needs to, there's a sequence to doing business. Most people don't realize there's a, what I call sequential success. You can't just kind of um, think that you're going to get result A if you haven't done all the 
the pieces beforehand. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of effort to get everything right beforehand before you launch. So something like your business, where it's food, a lot of focus, I would imagine, for you, for uh, yourself and your partner, Stuart, in this, will be that you have focused on getting the food part right, the look of the venue that you're going to use for your for your restaurants, and the you know the place that that's going to be positioned, and that's great, but that's just selling the food. That's not building the brand. The brand is a bigger story than that, and any brands that we know in the world that are recognizable known brands have become that because people have really been very clever about making sure that we know more about the brand than just the product or the service. Mm, yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Sam, for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Brilliant advice there. Thank you. I'm just going to move to the Q&A. Because uh, I can see someone's put, so someone would prefer to be anonymous. That's fine. Um, so their question is: My team and I, along with a very prominent nutrition science researcher, are working on a COVID nineteen and plant based nutrition related research study, which is a multi country quantitative study. But they'll kick can start, start with the US. Yeah, I know it's a bit complicated. So <laughs> I, it's a it's really <laughs> yeah. So it's an organization, and they together with a nutrition science researcher they're working on um a research study that's COVID-19 and plant-based nutrition related so it's a multi a multi-country study and it's quantitative so with small samples but they're going to kick start with the U.S. And they're saying we want to do a CPG style media campaign with the results and ensure mainstream media takes notice would love to hear your perspective I know that's quite um, What's a CPG style campaign? I don't even know what that is. Um, <clears throat> consumer packaged goods style okay. media campaign. So I, I know the person who does this and they used to work in um, for some of the big brands, uh, big companies, consumer packaged goods. Um, so I don't know if you want to maybe, perhaps the person who wrote that, if you want to maybe just clarify in the chat um, before. Well, we also I'm just kind of not you. sure what they're trying to achieve here. Um, you know, like you're, they're saying they want a particular type of campaign. Well, that may or may not be the right type of campaign because that's kind of often how people approach stuff. They, they approach with what they know, and this person may know that sort of campaign from past work experiences. But is that the right kind of campaign for this new venture? There's a different question. You know, um, particularly I find people that have been in business a long while think that they still have to do stuff in the way that they've always done it. So I've got um, a colleague, friend of mine, who um, very, very successful in, in the print magazine area and uh, was looking to launch a new venture. So her approach was the approach she'd always taken because that's what she knew. And I was like, you know what? You don't even need to worry about mainstream media these days for what you want to do with this new venture. You need to be, social has to be your number one thing. So to try and get her to change that mind shift because she'd always done a particular time in marketing. So um, if you've done something, that does not necessarily mean it's the right thing for the new venture. But I don't know uh, what, what they want to try and gain from it to be able to say... Uh, if that is the right sort of uh, marketing to go with. Mm. I think it's kind of getting the conversation going around the links, you know, by, by embracing healthy plant-based nutrition, it improves your immune system and, um, you know, can help against things like COVID or other. Um, yeah, I mean, it has, there are lots of studies coming out that are showing people who are vegan uh, are actually less prone to getting COVID. Um, so that's certainly something that an organization can expand on and put lots of messaging out there. From a business perspective, if somebody was wanting to attach a business to that concept, then it would probably be around the supplement area or something that helps boost people's immune systems. It's boosting their immune system because they're just eating healthier and they're not eating dead shit um and you know so but the there is medical findings already showing that so it's just kind of expanding on that and then how you would actually get that message out will depend on it's not just how you get a message out it's like what do you want the outcome to be what what are you trying to achieve as the outcome so you have to work 
everything is about working backwards in business. Everything is about that is the box of tissues, okay? I want somebody to buy that box of tissues. So how am I going to get them to do that? And you have to do, it's like you timeline everything backwards from the point of, you know, how's the box going to look? Where is it going to be positioned? What retailer do I want to put it into? What price point? Da, da, da. It's everything's about timelining your sequence backwards so that the steps you take to get to the end point are the correct sequence. Yeah, I hope that's been helpful to the person who posted that. Um, I noticed a couple of people have asked, so I might combine these questions. A couple of people have asked, Anne, if you don't have a specific um, physical product or even a service, but you've got like an online platform, so it could be like an e-commerce store or some kind of platform yeah. that you're looking to grow, what tips have you got uh, to promote that? Because that could be quite tricky because it's not necessarily your own, it might not even be your own products if you're selling like e-commerce, for example. So any tips on for people who have got like, um, yeah, online platforms? that they want to promote and get out there and attract people to? Uh, I've worked with online platforms for probably 18 years at this point. Um, at least half of my clients have massive online platforms. Um, for example, I've got a client at the moment who's in Chicago. They were, I say were, they still are a party business. So they were doing party supplies um, have moved them into being conscious of using recycled papers and all those kind of stuff. And then COVID hit and uh, they only sell online. So they sell through their own website and they sell through Amazon. They're, they're a number one seller on Amazon. And of course, nobody's having a party, are they, when there's COVID? So their business fell by 95% when COVID hit. So they had to learn to pivot and they, um, to cut a long story short, ended up creating 8,000 new products that, now their price point is low so they can create 8,000 new products, uh, not too expensive to do that. And to test these products, out of the 8,000 products they created, they ended up with about 80 that have become good sellers. But going back to the online piece of what they do, they have had to be super agile, super creative, and make sure they are making money from things that people um, want at any one time, which is what we all have to do. And COVID has actually kind of been interesting because for a lot of people, um, myself included, you know, I used to travel to America. I used to spend three weeks in Sydney every week, and the fourth week would be in LA or London. And I did that every month for the last 20 years. So for me, travel was just part and parcel of my life. Suddenly that's gone. Um, and with most businesses during COVID, stuff has just literally vanished. Customers have vanished because our lives have changed uh, beyond anything we could imagine. If you have an online business, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to be agile. You have to be able to change quickly. So the clients who were doing the party business, what they ended up doing is, you know, I helped them pivot and they started to do these cards that were teacher appreciation cards that teachers were then sending to their pupils or to their students. So the teachers who weren't seeing their students in class anymore were sending a physical card out to their student. Uh, they ended up selling a million packs of these cards uh, within about the first four to six weeks of bringing them out. All related to kind of COVID, we're, we're just kind of making fun of COVID and it, you know, it flew off. So they had never done anything like that before and suddenly they had to do something different. And then we also took that story to the media. So we then started to get that written in the, you know, the Chicago Tribune picked up in the story then radio stations and then podcasts and so on. So when you have an online platform, it, of course, yeah, you, you can't touch it, you can't see it, but it's still a brand. So the, the, the way that you approach it isn't really any different from how I was saying that Samantha and her partner, Stuart, need to think about their brand. You still have to be the spokesperson for the brand or somebody has to be. Somebody has to be talking about why they should buy a handbag from your brand. Uh, that's the online platform. Or they have to, um, you have to talk about the convenience of how your online platform, you know, gets deliveries to where they are. So 
you have to, it, I, I personally don't see online brands any different from a bricks and mortar. I don't see it any different from a product or a service. It's all business and it's all about how you communicate to your potential customers. Brilliant. So I don't think it needs to be thought of as different. It's the same approach really across the board. Yeah, I'm finding those hooks and storylines. Brilliant. I'm just conscious of time. So I think we maybe got time for one more question. I'm going to read Maria's question up because I think this will be helpful for anyone who's considering rebranding. So Maria um, owns a vegan cheese business here in Australia and they've been rebranding. So she's been making cheese for almost seven years under the brand name Sprout and Kernel. And they've recently yeah, rebranded. Well. Yeah, me it. too. I know we were talking about vegan cheese before we came on the call. Um, with they've rebranded just rebranded as blue mountains creamery and i've got some nice i've seen online some nice colorful packaging and maria's saying look we've done this for several reasons but the main two is that people always thought we sold seeds and nuts whereas blue mountains creamery tells you what we do we make vegan cheese etc um, but her question is what's the best way now to relaunch so they've done the rebrand they've got the nice new colorful packaging so they've got a rename repackaging um what's the best way to do a relaunch Anne? um well, it's kind of like any launch, because even if it's, it doesn't even necessarily be a relaunch, say you're bringing out a new product category or a new offering, because um, everybody listening will have different circumstances here. It's all about, okay, taking that and turning it into a story. Um, so, you know, with something like a relaunch, um, we have to look at current times because COVID is stopping certain things happening. But, you know, what can you do that's clever that will tie in with your product? I remember years ago when Ben and Jerry's ice cream came to the UK and they probably did this in almost any territory they went into, but I'm going back probably almost 25, 30 years ago. And they got on, they had Ben and Jerry go on every radio station and tell people that anybody called Ben or Jerry could queue up for an ice cream and get it for free for a week. And it got so much coverage. Like just, it was on every radio station, every news station, every print, bit, bit of print press. And obviously, you know, they backed that by having a product that people wanted to buy and tasted good and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, it was about doing a smart campaign. So it's always uh, about doing a smart campaign and doing something inventive. I had a friend who used to work for Guide Dogs for the Blind. She was their main marketing person. Unfortunately, um, Judith was a close friend and she actually died of a brain aneurysm a few years back. But she was amazing at marketing and she created this campaign about oh, maybe five or six years ago for Guide Dogs for the Blind, where she um, created these kind of $50 Australian notes, folded them in half. It was all printed. And then they were all flung in the CBD, Central Business District of Sydney, in the morning at eight o'clock. They put these in like, you know, on benches, on the on the metro and the buses, they were on the road, everywhere. So people were thinking they were finding a 50 buck note. They would open them and it would say the one thing that guide dogs can't find. <laughs> and it was to make a donation. And, uh, you know, they, that was her biggest campaign. And, and people really jumped at that and started to donate in a massive way when that campaign came out. So, you know, the one thing I'd say with any kind of launch, rebrand or anything, is don't do it quietly. <laughs> <laughs> Just whatever you're going to do, the more noise you can make, the more um, uh, interesting you can make it, the more likely that you will get um, copy and print and radio and everybody talking about you. That's the one side as a consumer, but what I would imagine you want as well is to make sure that your product is then getting stocked in as many of the retail outlets as possible. You know, so uh, whether I know that it was available in Woolworths, in my local Woolworths, because I was buying it in the Sprout and Kernel branding, and then it suddenly disappeared. Now, maybe it's disappeared because you're going to go and rebrand and bring it back under this new name, but you want to make sure that the buyers buy into the concept of your rebrand and that you can present that rebrand in the best possible way to them so that they are buying into okay we had this much shelf space here but now we're going to give you this amount more um 
you know, when I took my product to uh, Walmart uh, from doing it very successfully in the UK, then did presentations to Walmart, it was about acquiring the, um, the retail space. And Walmart was the biggest thing to be able to do because they normally got people to pay for that space. And I certainly didn't want to pay for the space. So we had to convince them that they would get rid of other product to make space for my product. So working with buyers becomes really important to make sure that they are as invested in your transition as you are. And then that you keep them on the side and nurture those buyers the whole way through the process so that they are as excited about your rebrand as you are and want to make sure it's there for the customers. Brilliant. I think that's really good advice for everyone. I'm just conscious of time and particularly Anne's time as well because we've already gone for the 90 minutes. I can see that there are a few other questions. Some of them are kind of asking about how they can work with you. So um, I I can respond to that. I'll respond in an email with a link to Anne's website, Plant Future, um, which is plantfuture.com. You can go there and actually sign up and get on the mailing list for when um, she launches. But um, if there's any questions I can answer or any like little queries like that, I will endeavor to do that afterwards. Um, But I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who showed up live today you will be getting an email with the recording so you can go back through it because I think there's a lots of really good advice regardless of the type of business that you're in and even answering specific people's questions I'm sure that you'll you can learn something from that so I highly recommend you go through and have a, a re-listen again um, and I'd also like to um, yeah very much thank Anne thank you so much you're obviously amazing incredible um, thank you for allowing me to debut you to the vegan <laughs> plant-based business world I think it's incredible and really excited um, about what you're doing and how we can all just yeah really help to as you say fast track the growth of this space which is amazing so thank you so much for being here and thank you everyone enjoy your rest of your morning daytime evening wherever you are I can see lots of people saying thank you thank you so much so thank Thank you very much everyone everybody for for staying on or getting up early or staying up late to to listen in and uh God, I, I miss being able to travel. I'd love to see you all in person. And hopefully we can all do that sometime quite soon. But to be part of this vegan movement of change that we're all part of now is just so damn exciting. So let's make sure we do take over the world and start saving more animals' lives. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Love that. Thank you so much. And thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye for now. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Bye.